I'm excited today to talk to a man who has um, invented um, a set of rules and constraints for, for the German Football Federation and, and is looking to change how uh, the game is played in Germany. Um, I'd like to um, thank Matthias Lockman for giving up his time today. And uh, Matthias, thank you yeah. so much for um, getting involved in this conversation about how parents and volunteer coaches and, and kind of novice coaches can help kids get engaged with football. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the ideas that you have and, and, and the vision that you have for German football? Yes, uh, so at first, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity, Simon, to talk here. And it's a great pleasure. And the ideas um, I had, uh, I had these ideas uh, since 20 years. And the idea is to construct the football on basis of the rights of the children. And, or to measure if the football is constructed um, um, to, um, if familiar to the rights of the children, yeah. And this is this idea is not from me. This is from Horst Wein, uh, a man who died uh, in two thousand sixteen. He was a former hockey coach in the eighties and seventies, and um, so I met him in two thousand three. I was a soccer coach in this time at Mainz 05. There was a coach you know very well. This is Jurgen Klopp. He was the coach of the first team. And in this time, uh, I was the under 15 coach there. And um, the time before, it was not clear that is something wrong in the, with the German football, especially uh, the competition model, model for the children. But more and more, I recognized that we exclude too many children from sports. And this is not uh, what a club has to do. And the club has to do uh, to give the children the opportunity to play and not say, oh, you are sitting on the bench. Oh, on this weekend, you are too weak. You have to stay home. Um, or, oh, you are not good enough. Let's uh, put uh, you on a position where you have maximum three con ball contacts. And um, let's play the, uh, let's give the better guys uh, all the ball contacts. And um, during the years, it was clear for me that the construction of the game, the rules that we apply, uh, the coordination system that we give to the children causes all these problems. It is not the coach, it is the system. And mm -hmm. this was a bad um, information on one side, but a good on the other side, because if you have a system that leads to all these negative effects, you can at first you say, oh, I can do nothing because the system is given from the uh, federation. But on the other hand, if you construct a system new and the federation gives this new system to the children, then you heal everything. And this was the idea. And uh, so we started to really push that in 2015. I think that's, that's, that's an interesting point. And that's what got me really excited about your idea. Yeah was this, um, this, the environment. So we both have experienced working in, in professional sport, both in professional football, um, and the system and the environment prior to these changes, although these changes haven't been implemented yet, they, they're about to be implemented. The yeah. environment before that was um, based on scarcity. Is the last sentence, yeah. The, the, the system was based on scarcity. So it was based on the fact that 1% um, or less than 1% of, of kids would go on and progress into being professional uh, yeah. people. And, and that's true across pretty much every sport. So yeah. it's based on using competition as a ranking tool. So how, how good are you? Yeah. So where that works really well, and this is what I was interested in, was where it works really well is obviously in competitive sport, in professional sport, where, where the winner takes all. It works perfectly well. But as you said, when you're looking at the, the younger age group, and, and we're focused here particularly on sort of 9 to 12-year-old kids, when they first get a taste of, of, of sports-specific skills, and in particular, in this case, football, then what you're looking at there is that 
the environment is still geared up to scarcity. It's still geared up to the winner takes all. And, and I think that's what really excites me about your idea is you're using competition in a very different way. Could you describe yeah. what changes you've made? Um, because I think for the, the volunteer coach, the mum and dad coach, they've grown up and they know competition and they understand that. But now yeah. we're competition but, in a different way. Yeah, yeah but it, it, people think we do not use competition. This is completely wrong. We use more competition and we use this more competition in another way. And you told us um, that all, all over the world we see that the um, clubs in different sports use competition as a selection tool. Yeah? This is one side, but you have to use the competition as a development tool. You have both sides. And what we did is we added the development thing with um, out taking the um, selection away. It is still there, but we uh, added the development point. And how you can uh, add the, the development point is giving every children the same playing time. So if you go to the UNICEF rights of the children, um, the first right is um, equality all over the children. Yeah, or, or e e um, yeah. Um, and how you can uh, transfer this to sports, you have every children to give the same playing time. So it is really easy to understand. This is not a difficult thing. This is not rocket science. Very, very easy. You have to answer two questions. Who needs more ball contacts um, to, for developing to a world-class player? Lionel Messi or children age five or six? The answer is clear. It's, it's the children. Yeah? And the second question you have to answer, in which um, game you have more ball contacts, in two versus two or 11 versus 11? And the answer, everybody knows, in two versus two. Two versus two is the smallest game you can play. If you play one versus one, it is not a team sports. Yeah? It is one versus one. But if you play two versus two, you have a teammate and you can start all doing all the things you need in the big game. And so this means if we know, number one, that uh, very young children needs a lot of ball contacts, then we can make um, a mark there. And if you know, number two, uh, that the best game to apply the most ball contacts you can give is two versus two, then we can make it to market uh, as well. And if you put both things together, the logic says to you, you have to apply two versus two to the youngest children. A step, and the next step is one age group older, you have to apply uh, three versus three, and four versus four, five versus five, and so on and so forth. And if the children or youth players are 14 or 15 years old, you reach 11 versus 11. Every good education system does this. Look at school or no um, person would give a children with a foot size um, 33 the shoes of the father with 44. What would happen? The, the children would crash. But in soccer we do. since. 40 years yeah? and we ask ourselves why do we have um, not enough um, extraordinary players and the, uh, it is simple to answer we give too many children the wrong shoes age 44 instead of 33 or 35 you have to um, adapt the game and the rules to the age of the children every good education does this so we have to do this in football and I will repeat two things. At first, uh, a small, uh, a young children has to have many, many ball contacts. And the second, the, the best game to give um, the most ball contacts is two versus two, ready. And um, how you organize it, <laughs> it's easy. You have to um, apply six to eight uh, small pitches on a big soccer pitch. And let's play the children there two versus two, um, five times or in, in five or six different pitches, yeah? So, um, to jump in there, in, in, so I'm based in, in Cardiff in Wales, so the FAW have introduced small games. Yeah. And what's interesting in, in that environment, uh, so I coach uh, under nines and under tens in, in Cardiff for the Canted Lips, which is a local, local team. And I'm, yeah. I'm not a football specific coach. I, my background is in fitness and, and helping people um, in that respect. So that's why I was involved in sport. Um, so 
when you watch that group, what's interesting is there's still competition. So yeah, the coaches still want to win, right? You know, nine and 10, they still want these kids to win. And so what's really interesting for me is changing when you, you're now going to put two goals in, two goals per pitch. And I'll, I'll send out links for, for Nino and a lot of the information that you, you share. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for doing that in English as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I'll send out those links. And, and so I won't go into too much detail today, but it really is a huge shift in narrative from, from, from using competition in ranking, but as you say, using it in a different way. And this way is to help kids make better decisions. You're on the ball. Can you make a better decision? Without too much information, without too much overwhelm. And so one of the other things is, the, is, is that the coaches, and this is what I find really interesting, is that the coaches don't have to set, just set it up. It's constraints-based. You design it, you create the environment, and then you let the kids go and do it. You yeah. step out of it. You let go of it a lot. And, um, and you let the kids, as you say, it's, it's, it's child-centric development. Now, that, for me, is, is a super interesting idea because... The other thing that we need to talk about is not only the sports specific skills, but fundamental movement skills for the kids. And so being able to coach kids where you just put a playing field down and then say, right, the environment is right for you. Go make some decisions, go make your mistakes, go pick up where you left off and, and, and go and uh, become a better footballer by, by enjoying the environment that you're in. I think that's a super interesting idea. Yeah, this is how nature works. So um, if you see animals learning um, a lion, what is a lion do? Uh, what does a lion do? A young lion, always free playing with brother and not the mother lion says, oh, you have to took this or this or this. It's free playing. Nature, uh, can you remember how you started to learn to walk? Nobody said to you, oh, you have to do this and this and your knee ankle must be this and this. You, you started to walk and you um, failed and you started again and again. And the children have a highly adapt, uh, adaptive uh, brain. So they have 400, 400 milliards neurons, interconnections. And if you are an adult person, you have 100 milliards. This is um, four times less. Yeah? But the children, uh, the network it, it has in his brain is highly adaptable and you have to present an environment that stimulates this and you would like to have decision makers if you would like to have decision makers you you shouldn't you should stop to say to the children play dribble shoot because you as an adult person takes the decision and you cut uh, in this way you cut the children from decision making and if the children should make their own decisions, they have to decrease of freedom to to decide. And um, this is the way we come back to the contra construction of the game. If you have two goals on a pitch, the children can dribble to goal number one. But if uh, there's a defender in front of goal number two, the children can decide to change the direction immediately and go to goal number two. And this happens permanently, permanently, permanently. And inside the rules, we have another situation where the children can permanently decide. So um, we don't have a free kick. We don't have a throw in. So the children uh, can take the ball and kick in or dribble in. This means uh, ev in every situation, you have minimum two degrees of freedom to decide. And the coach has to be silent in this situation and not to talk because then the children has a chance to make the, the mistakes yeah, and learn from it. Absolutely. And going back to that, my experience of, of working in professional football and, and professional sport is we've got to remember that there are millions of kids playing sports and very, very well, less than 1% get picked, right? Yeah. So we start off at a very young age and we potentially are big fish in, in, in a small pond and we do very well uh, and, and parents get excited. So you mentioned earlier about the development of somebody. So we crawl, we walk and we run, but often we get carried away and we start running really quickly and we think, oh, our kid's really good. Our kid's really good or our team's really good and we, you know, we want success for them and there's nothing wrong with that. But that informs our decisions. 
And so as the kids develop, they grow into bigger audiences. So they go to secondary school and then they, so they become a, they become a small fish in a very big pond. And that's the issue. And that's one of the things I was going to talk to you about is participation. Kids start dropping out of sport as they realize, oh, maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was. Maybe, yeah. maybe uh, I'm not winning as often as I, as I thought I, I used to, right? So I'm, yeah. and, so, and so it becomes very difficult for kids to create context for themselves. Whereas this way around, what we're doing is saying, right, well, let's make these kids make, just make better decisions full stop. Let's not worry about the competition. Let's just help them make better decisions and be more skillful as football players and connect and enjoy this sport so they connect with their friends and they create social bonds. And so they, the transition, and this is where people get lost, is the transition when they're sort of 9 to 12, 12 to 15, and the, the number of kids dropping off in the sport becomes, becomes a real problem. Was yeah. that that, that, that you saw in Germany and it, it, was that one of the reasons behind the decisions that have been made? So, um, the, the, the problem in Germany, we have this problem, yeah, but we have another problem too because we have a high, we had a high dropout uh, in age uh, seven, nine in the last years. Um, we could see that uh, less and less teams uh, play football and the question is why? And um, so I did an analysis. It was a structural analysis. I um, I saw that we have four bro or four or five problems in the system that permanently exclude children. Yeah? And my idea was to change this in a way that football is a participation tool and not a de-participation tool. So um, now the new system is a part participation tool. Um, it involves everybody. The old system um, used the less developed players as necessary um, side effects or whatever you, you can call it, yeah, and um, kicked them out uh, that 1% uh, can be millionaires later on. Yeah? And um, so we have four, four different problems. We see in, um, in the big cities that we have a lot of players in the clubs and the, the, the coaches, um, they have the problem that they put the children on the bench, have to put them on the bench or leave them at home because it's, they have too, much, uh, too many players. Yeah? And we see um, outside from the cities, in these regions, um, we have a different problem. We have not enough players to have one team. So, uh, what, so we have two different problems in two different areas. So if you use um, smaller teams, you can play on the weak development areas uh, with a team with three players. And the big cities, you can divide a team of 15 players in um, five uh, teams with three players. And the problem is solved. And every uh, children has the chance to play. And this is not a decision of the coach. This is a, um, a decision of the federation to only allow this kind of playing style in these age groups. Yeah. And the other thing we have, we still have, is what you uh, said, that we have a big dropout in age 12, 13, 14, and so on. And mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, related to different things. But what we know is, if a children yeah. is five years old and you have five years development and you don't develop the necessary skills to go the next steps, then the probability for dropout is higher because you see oh, my body is not uh, good enough developed for these sports. What, sh what can I do here? So nothing, yeah, I go. And um, this is another reason why we lose players age 12, 30, uh, 14, because they feel they are not prepared for this game. And the reason is they had only one or two ball contacts in each game for many, many years. And so we hope if, um, if we develop uh, the children in age six, seven, eight, nine better, then more children will stay in the system. We have other reasons why uh, children uh, drop out with age 11, 12, 13. Um, we, everybody knows that we have the changes um, in the biological development. Uh, young um, people will be adult people some years later and uh, we have 
so many different other um, things in the society. So uh, PlayStation is a big thing and uh, many, many other things. But um, nevertheless, if the football is attractive, or football must be more attractive than PlayStation. Yeah? If this is the case, then uh, the children will come back or the, the youth players. Yeah? And this is a question <laughs> on the idea on the, uh, was the, on the, on the yeah. was that we can look at the foundational, the fundamental movement skills for these kids as well and prepare them in a way so that we are not in a rush. We talked earlier about crawl, walk, run. And when we're in a rush to develop kids because we want them to be the best and, and we want them to be selected and chosen, then we perhaps we miss the sports, the, we, we put an emphasis on sports specific and we miss the, the foundational movement skills, the fundamental movement skills that kids require to move well and feel comfortable and confident that what they, that the skills that they have match the environment. So yeah. currently when we, when we watch kids play on big pitches, there's, there's a much bigger demand to move well because obviously they're up against more players, they've got a bigger pitch, the ball is bigger. Um, some of the kids will have developed quicker. So there's a lot of challenge there within the environment. And perhaps they, they don't have the skills to, to meet the task that they've, been, that they've been given. And so when we, when we set up in, in um, games which are small sided and where the kids are allowed to play, then perhaps we can look at setting up kids on a different area and helping them control their own body weight because we're not so invested in um, trying to push these kids into making decisions that, that we feel are right, but we're allowing them to make their decisions. And that, for me, was, was a really exciting idea that I think we can develop as, as, this, as this idea of Fanino really takes place um, across the world. And football can then be used as a, as a real force for, for change. Yes, um, so let me go deeper in that, because behind that is the so-called uh, game intelligence approach. And the game intelligence approach um, based, is based on four phases. These four phases um, are, at first, you observe the environment. If you have to solve a problem in, in sports, you observe the environment, looking where is the opponent, where is the ball, where are my teammates. Second, you have to understand the decision, uh, the, the, the situation. And if you understood, then you have decision making. Okay, I have three degrees of freedom. Let's take number one. And the last one is execution. And if you really uh, think deep in that, you know this is not football, this is life. Because if you wake up in the morning and go out of your bed, the first thing is, oh, where I am, at home or in a hotel? Ah, I uh, do observations. Yeah. Then I understand, okay. I'm at home, I have to, and then I have to, to make the decision. Oh, I have to go to the toilet or to the coffee machine. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, it is in uh, competition, maybe. And um, so then you have the execution, and you do this the whole day. And if you start sleep, it stops. Yeah. And in between, do you have 90 minutes to play? But in these 90 minutes, you have to take this 1,800 times as, as one person. And as a team, 20,000 times. Yeah? And um, this means we start to construct the game on basis of this approach, um, on this game intelligence approach. A person has a high uh, game intelligence if this person has good observation skills, if this person has a good understanding, if this person uh, can make the right decisions fast, if the person is good in execution. And what we did in the past, we focus only on execution, 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 execution. But it's just stupid because um, if you can only execute, but in um, a senseless manner, yeah, um, it it lead to nothing. It will lead to nothing. Yeah, you, you're picking up skills that help you win, right? So yeah. um, this way around, we're picking up skills based on the environment. We're picking yeah. up on on what what's required. Yeah. The other interesting thing about this is, is we're meeting kids where they are, not yeah. where we want them to be, because we yeah. them, but where they actually are, where they are in that environment. So that's, for me, is super interesting. We're going to meet the kids where they are, 
not where we want them to be or where we think they are so that we can win a game. Um, and and I, from my own experience, I picked up um, coaching kids. So my, my kids are, are, are nine and 11 now, but at the time they were about eight and 10. And I remember the first couple of weeks, I didn't want, when I took them into football, I really didn't want to get involved because I, I've seen um, so many competitive parents. I've seen so many kids not make it. It's heartbreaking. They've put all their efforts into this and they, and they don't make it. And, and so I, I was really passive as a parent and, and I just stood out of the way and thought, I'm not getting involved. And about three or four weeks into it, I'm watching my kids play football and I realize I'm stood on the touchline. For the first three weeks, I was like, I was miles away. And, and I just, I was passive and I thought, I'm not getting involved. And, and after a while, I st I like, oh, I'm still on the touchline. I'm, get I'm, I'm getting involved. And, and so I started, the next three weeks, I'm carrying a bag of footballs onto the pitch. I've got myself. I'm like, I, I want to get involved. And, and I realized that to, I, I, but I wasn't really enjoying it because I, I was worried about what the parents thought. I, worried, I was worried about what the kids thought. And I was worried about whether I was doing a good job. And I wrote down three directives, a philosophy for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is before I, I, I bumped into, into the, your work. Uh, and let me just read them. Yep. Were, we don't care who wins. We do yeah. care that our kids compete for and with each other. We don't care about confident players getting more game time. We do care that each kid gets the same amount of time playing. We don't care that our confidence kids play out of position. We do care that all our players play in every position on the pitch. And I wrote that out and it was a game changer for me. It was yeah. a complete game changer. I relaxed because I was confident in the structure that I've created and, and I could let go. And, and if the parents didn't like it, then they could go somewhere else. Um, and, and that just allowed me just to, for myself to let go and let the kids play a little bit more. And so yeah. that's one of the reasons why I thought this is really interesting, these constraints that you're putting in place. And then the second thing was after about three weeks, another three weeks, I'm watching the kids run around. You know, they, they're all around the football. And I thought, hang on a minute. I'm, I, I don't want to be that crazy coach on the sideline shouting at my kids. I've got to think of something else to do. So what I did, in Wales, we play uh, under nines and under tens, we play five a side. So it's on a small pitch. Yeah, it's you good. Got, you've got a kid in goals, and then you've got you've got four kids out. And I said to him, right, I said, I tell you what, we're going to go into a square, and each kid, you're going to see who's in front of you, who's diagonal to you, and who's to the side of you. And the only three things I want to shout are, you're lost, so where are you on the pitch? Well done, and go and get the ball. And that was it. I only wanted to say three things because I didn't want to be that crazy man on the side of the pitch. Yeah. And that completely changed. Because I gave the emphasis and the spatial awareness to the kids to choose. And, and I watched them start to, to, to organize themselves and start to talk to each other. And, and it meant that I didn't have to shout and I could just quietly just, just say three things. You lost, go get the ball, and well done. And that, can, that was a, another huge change for me. So then as I'm thinking about you know, how I show up as a coach and, and what I do for these kids, I then came into your stuff and I thought, oh, wow, right, this is, this, this is a big idea. So the narrative has been that over the last 40 years, we compete, you know, the best, the strongest win, whereas now this is all about the underdog. This is all about the 99%. This is all about participation. This is all about every kid meeting them where they are and, 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 and empowering them to make better decisions and stepping away. And, and I can say that in, in a very limited, with very limited skill and very limited knowledge, I think I've changed how I show up for, for the kids. Mm. I think I've changed the environment for the kids. So I think from my own personal point of view, I think it's super powerful. And so I'm really looking forward to applying these principles of Fenina, which as I said, I'll share with, with the group later on. But oh. mm. what, when I do apply that, and this is why I'm excited because I think most kids, uh, most parents, and most volunteers can do this because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, no, I've no skill as a football coach, like zero skill. So, yeah, yeah, maybe you are the better coach. <laughs> well, this is the interesting thing: is beginner's mind, right? Yeah. 
I honestly believe this. So start at the start. And, and this is what I've done. And this is why I find it interesting is building it up from the start. Yeah. So what, so I, I start for Nino it, it, next week. I start a trip. No, I start tomorrow. I start a training session tomorrow. What can I, so I put two goals either side, the 12 meters between them. I'll, I'll send out the dimensions to everyone later on. What can I expect to see? So what you uh, can expect, um, you, your this game for Nino is three versus three on four goals. You don't you don't should forget it because if you use four or five players, maybe you will have a problem. Yeah. So it is designed for three versus three on four goals. The name is Funinho. But this game is only in this big game intelligence approach, one game. Okay. Yeah. And it is designed for children six to nine. And uh, what what you can um, what you would see is children will uh, dribble five times more than in comparison to the seven versus seven. Mm -hmm. So we measured it out. Yeah. So what you will see is that the heart rate of each children is much higher in this game uh, because the involvement is much higher. What you see is that the children have five times more ball contacts. Yeah? And you can play this game with the goalkeeper. Maybe one person uh, is able to defend the two goals in the shooting zone. Yeah? Then this is the box. Yeah? And um, then you see five times more goalkeeper actions because children have five times more uh, shoots on the goal. And what you can see is that maybe you have 12 children, so you have two pitches, one pitch with three where the three, another with three where the three, then six on one pitch and six on the other. Absolutely. And if you have another six, you make a, a third pitch, okay? And everybody's involved. This is the difference between the traditional approach and this approach, that the involvement is the first paragraph. You have to have the same involvement for every children. If you don't have, it is your mistake as a coach. And not the mistake of the children. It is your mistake. Yeah? And you have to think, uh, you rethink how I have to design um, the game and the, the tournament I do or the competition I do that every children has the same involvement. Um, <clears throat> so if we play a Foninho festival with 64 players on a, an adult pitch, we have eight different small pitches, three where the three, and in every pitch we play three where the three with one rotational player. Mm. And mm. we have seven games of seven minutes. This means we have seven times a result, and we use this result to measure the performance of the team. This means if you are in uh, pitch number one and you win the game, you can go up to pitch number two. If you lose in pitch number two, you have to go down to pitch number one after seven minutes. And you feel seven times in this tournament the pain of losing or the happiness of winning. Yeah? And this means we do not um, delete the competition. We have it in a much powerful way. And we use the result not for making a table and say, okay, this team is on number one. We use this to put teams in the right manner together because after three or five games, the strongest teams will play uh, together uh, against each other. And, 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 uh, yeah. A, a, an, interesting, an interesting point, isn't it? That um, we'll obviously see more football contact, we'll see better decisions, we'll see um, more time on the ball. Each yeah. game gets their own uh, opportunity to play um, and then they, they compete um, at a level, they find their levels. And this is what I was talking about earlier, is that we meet kids where they are and then they find their levels. And, and the narrative has been the same for 40, 40, 50 years, as long as both of us have been around, for definite. Um, and so I understand that Fernino is just part of it, but I guess parents and, ki uh, and, and coaches of, of kids and teachers have to start somewhere. Would this be the best place to start? This small game, you ask me if this is the best place to start. Yeah. I think the best place to start is to play two versus two. Right, okay. Because, yeah, to make a Foninho pitch 
uh, take the half size of a Fernino pitch and play two versus two. At the beginning, um, you need no goals. You can use the lines as goal lines. And uh, the first step is to dribble above the line. This is a goal. Okay. Yeah, this yeah. is enough as a starting point. Yeah. We talk about five or six years old uh, children, okay? And later you use maybe one goal for some weeks. And if you have the feeling that the children have the first, um, they, they learned the first techniques, then use maybe two goals. Yeah, And the technical development comes from the, the many ball contacts they have inside the game. Yeah. If you play a lot of two versus two and one versus one, you can um, apply as exercises. Then the people, uh, the children have so many ball contacts in the right manner that their technique um, starts to develop excellent. So I did this with my son and a lot of the different children here since 2015. And we um, only made games to develop the children. Games, games, games. And they have excellent technique now uh, with age 12, 13. Yeah? And if I compare it to these others uh, with the classic, from the classical approach, I see only a few with a good technique. And in the group I had, mostly all of the children developed a good technique. And only from uh, playing the small-sided games. And the, the reason behind this, you can count the ball contacts by video analysis. And you see in a normal training session, a coach with 12, uh, with six or seven years old players, he has a lot to do in organization to keep the group together. If he is alone with 20, uh, six or seven years old, he has no chance. So he has to find a solution to bring the children as soon as possible to the game because they came to the football club to play football. Not only one children will go outside and make exercises. Every children will take the ball and wait for uh, um, the neighbor and another neighbor and they start to make a game. So <laughs> children come to the club to do the games and not exercises, yeah? This is really, I'm gonna go uh, uh, by this one. Because and so obviously in, in movement and in fitness. And so I realized that the, the label on that, when I turned up was football. So I, yeah. I thought, right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do football because that's the label and that's what everyone expects and that's what the parents expect. Uh, but of course, in professional football, you do a warm up, you do some speed agility work, you might do some conditioning work, you know, yeah. you know depending on the manager, you know, you might run them or you might, you know, set up drills, whatever. So, so it, that was my back. Yeah, but and so, like this. sorry, um, you know what a kindergarten is? Yeah. Yeah. You don't apply integral um, mathematics in the kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I know. Uh, and so, so it's a big learning experience for me. And, and, and but of course, you know, You've got, you talked about influences earlier and you've got social media, you've got Instagram, you know, Southampton are using this drill, Bayern Munich, Pep, what? Yeah. So, you know, and, and so you don't have to go very far to watch very complicated drills for kids yeah. who, are, who are young and don't have the skills, let's be honest. So what I found interesting was, was that was the, that was the, it's football, so, so, we, so we need to play about with that. And then... I started introducing things like skipping. So you'd have kids skipping and you'd have kids playing. Um, and, and as you said, you, you can quite, because I have 20 kids. And when I first started, I started as a student maybe 20, 30 years ago as coaching. I, there were kids, that, I, I couldn't even get them to take their, their rucksacks off. Hmm. <laughs> they were running around and it was chaos. And I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, did, I had no clue what I was doing. And I'm not saying I've got much of a clue now, but... I got 20 kids and that's quite a lot you know young kids 9 10 they want entertaining and so you can feel quite a lot of pressure and I think it's understandable where coaches just go oh we'll chuck you into a big game and we'll, we'll just manage the crowds whereas I think what this able and enables you to do is set up as you say small games which are engaging the kids can play and then you can have stations where you're like right can you skip can you hop can you jump can you crawl can you play 
and develop your fundamental movement skills and play in games where you can play football. So you, so you can start to have really engaging stations where the kids can, can develop as athletes, as their social skills, their teamwork. So there's a lot going on. And I think it's, it, 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 it's, quite, a, it's quite doable for, for, for a very inexperienced coach. Yes, um, so the, the, the big advantage is, so if, what, what works well with children is, if you have 20, yeah, start yeah. immediately to make maybe, um, yeah, four versus, also three versus three, and the rotational player means four children, okay? Then you have four and four, it's eight, one group, the next eight, another group, you have 16, and then uh, you have four left. So you can make one pitch, two versus two with the four, and two other pitch, three versus three, um, with a rotational player, and the 20 children are immediately start to play. And then the thing is organized, yeah? And you are on this uh, um, sweet spot of the, of the motivation of the children. And what you can change is the rules in the, in the games. On pitch number one, you can rotate the goals uh, to the opposite side. So the children have to make other movements and this means their uh, athletic um, performance will be trained in another way because they have to do these other movements. And so we have 50 different um, possibilities to change the rules of the games in only three versus three. And yeah? I've, I've got that as, as a link. It's amazing, an amazing resource. Um, yeah. And it's easy to apply. You have the, the, the biggest advantage is you increase quality only by organ organization. And this means we have a tool for people who have no idea how they have to educate in football. And if you think in a nation like Germany with 80 million people and you apply a system that increases quality um, from maybe 20% to 80% and it costs no money because it's only a changing of the rules then the efficiency will go up in uh, in some years. Yeah, absolutely. It's clear. And I, I just to, I, I mean, I I could geek out on this all day, but um, get. I think to to help sort of parent coaches and volunteer coaches, I think that seems to be the best way, best place to start. Um, yeah. You mentioned game intelligence. That is something that um, is then changing how you help people make decisions so as you said if you think about uh developing habits or making decisions just based on what you see how you respond whether you get a reward from that response what action yeah. you take as a result of that of that observation yeah. um where where else uh, can we read about game intelligence where you can find more information you mind Okay, um, there's a concept in English available. Um, it's a so-called uh, teaching games of understanding. Uh, it is not a new approach. Um, if you um, Google this, uh, teaching games for understanding, you will find a lot, not only in football. Um, it is um, related to basketball and all the team sports. Yeah, And uh, this uh, concept shows you that you do not only apply exercises or games, it shows you that you give the children the environment and the children um, try to find solutions in this environment. And if they can't find, you go into dialogue with the children. Yeah? So this is not only a, a passive um, system for uh, people who only apply um, the exercises or the games. So you, ha you can go into dialogue. Yeah? And um, the, the most important coach uh, related to football was Horst Wein. And you can find his literature. It's some years um, older now. Um, Game Intelligence. If you Google this and Horst Wein, uh, you will find his book. Um, it's from the early 2000s. But it's still, um, um, it is still true what in this book uh, he wrote down. And um, he, he, he wrote a book in English, Youth uh, Development. Um, uh, what is the name? Um, uh, Google it, yeah. Um, Horst Wein, and you can find the English literature. So we have two um, 
major books. The one is more for the adult um, players, and the other one more for uh, the players uh, age six to to twelve. Yeah, and um, in his books, you can find um, a lot of information. It's much more than you uh, uh, you can apply to the pitch. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's key. That's key. To do today was to give parents, teachers, and coaches somewhere to start and somewhere to, to begin to watch rather than rush, as I said earlier, crawl, walk, run, begin to crawl, begin to play with these ideas. And then, yes, of course, go and have a look at game intelligence, develop your coaching philosophy, but start at the very start and, and, and just relax. Just get into it, develop your own coaching philosophy, um, and, and just ensure that you're comfortable with it before you worry about what everyone else is doing and, and um, you know, what, what are the wonderful, weird and wonderful examples there are, are out there in, in social media. Um, Matthias, thank you uh, for, yeah. for, for talking to me today. And, and um, I think this is a great place to, to stop and um, hopefully we can continue this conversation because although... Um, as we talked about, the, the narrative has been the same for the last 40, 40 plus years. That narrative is beginning to change. And I think this conversation will hopefully help parents um, and, and, and coaches understand why that narrative is changing and, and the need for that change in the narrative and, and not to be afraid of, well, we're going to lose competition and therefore um, we're going to go soft on the kids. That, it isn't about that. It's about helping kids make better decisions. It's about the kids being at the centre of what we're doing. And it's about us as, as coaches creating it, an, an, an environment for those kids where they can, they can flourish because we can see further down the line, kids are dropping out of sport. Uh, and not only sport, but also activities because they relate the two things, sports and activities. They are different. And it's important that we, we make those differentiation. Um, but that, that we give the kids the skills to develop into active, healthy, and curious kids. And I think the work that, that you've done, and I know you've mentioned uh, your mentor, Horse Vine, incredible work. Um, and um, I'm super excited to see what happens. Uh, here in Wales, we've got small sided games, but there's still some way to go to help. Um, help coaches understand what these change, what this change in narrative is all about. So, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you again. And uh, I think a last a last sentence. Um, what is key is that the federation works not against um, the ideas. Yeah, it you have only a chance to go in this direction if the competition system um, that the federation applies to the country is not against these ideas. If this was the problem in the last 40 years here, we had some coaches like you and me who tried to give their personal philosophy to the children, but the competition system of the federation worked against it and all the parents worked against it due to this competition system. And if you have this, you have no chance. So therefore it is very um, key to have the federation on your side. And if you have contact to the federation, start to bring this, them uh, to apply these approaches uh, from Belgium, Austria now, Germany now, and so on. I don't know exactly how the situation is, situation is in your country, but um, they will have no chance if they do not apply uh, the small-sided games approach um, in the competition model. It, it, it is <laughs> the FAW has tried it, but the narrative um, is, is, is shifting unquestionably, and we're watching that shift now. I think coaches and parents and, and, and teachers need, just need to engage with it and play with it and understand the, 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 where this narrative is shifting. Uh, yeah. and, and as you've rightly said, it's about the reason it hasn't shifted until this point is the, the environment. The environment. What, wasn't wasn't um, wasn't conducive to that change, and 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 you can talk about change all you like, but uh, unless the environment is is um, is in place, then then we don't see that change. And so, yeah, um, this is part of that. Th this content is part of that conversation. So, yeah, thank you so much for bringing it to everyone's attention, and um, 
And uh, I really look forward to engaging with uh, your ideas um, in, in the coming years. Thank you, Matthias. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Have a nice time. Take care.